Um, it's good to be here with y'all. We're the people that they, y'all, your church comes down to and helps out with Encounter down in, in Canyon Lake, Texas. I've known Paul and Kim and your pastor for 25 years. When I thought about that, I go, oh man, I'm, that makes me feel old. So I know somebody 25 years. And so uh, anyway, we're, if y'all ever want to come down and check it out, it's just a lovely, beautiful work uh, with these, the most severely abused girls in the state of Texas. And they have severe trauma. These kids are worse than Hollywood depictions, their stories are. And I get to hear their stories, and I feel privileged when they tell me, when I mentor, I mentor, mentor five at a time, and I always tell them, tell me your story. And they tell me their story. And I've not seen a Hollywood picture that has told the stories of their lives yet, that how, hard, how bad they are. But they, we've seen over a third of them come to Jesus, and most of them, the largest number is at Encounter, where y'all come down and help out, so I invite you to come down and check it out. They're not scary. I know some people are afraid of teenagers, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're damaged, you know, they're hurt, and, and they, need all, they need everything we can give them. And uh, they need to see love, and they need, and you can't give them enough. And uh, so they're not scary. They usually act pretty nice around us anyway. So, uh, but sometimes we do see some things, but I've been, I go in quite regularly, and I don't see a whole lot of the fights and stuff that goes on, but I hear about all of it. So uh, anyway, um, we have some information in the back if you want to sign up for our newsletter, our prayer team, and also from today's sermon, there is a handout I give you. I think it's a really interesting thing of why some people struggle so today we're going to be talking about truth and compassion, and I've compiled a list of why some people struggle, because I've always found them. Why do some people do better than others? And why do some people struggle? And why do some people not grow? And, you know, and I've always I just, you know, fathomed me, and the different people I've worked with over my life, I started just writing down things to help me understand. And if we understand what different people struggle with, It'd be easier practically for us to have compassion for people because all of us struggle with something. To, to what degree does it knock us off or keep us from all that God has for us is, is the issue. So today we're going to be talking about, slide one, the great need for truth and compassion. And this, the context I'm speaking of is for struggling Christians and the lost. How to have compassion and truth for people who struggle. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Let's pray. Oh God, I pray today that you would move hearts to a greater understanding of what people struggle with and what the lost are facing and what people have been through so that, Lord, we would have mercy and compassion just like you. And Lord, today, Holy Spirit, I pray you would do something with this in our hearts. All of us, move us closer to your heart for people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we live in an age where there's an attack on truth, morals, family, and marriage. We live in an age where people believe in relative truth. And this is this is crazy how the devil got away with this one. All truth is equal. And man, that's a phenomenon you've got to understand and start trying to equip yourself with it. We live in an age where style is more important than substance. Words have no inherent meaning. Western culture is considered oppressive because it's found on Judeo-Christian Principles. Did you know that? That's a common theme you hear amongst, you talk to young people and stuff. Anyway, that feeling replaces thinking is another concept today. People don't, you know, they don't hear truth. They say, well, I got to feel something. And that's very dangerous. We're in a dangerous era is what it is. Young people in America believe that America was founded on racism and don't think America is a great country. Did you know that? I don't know where they're learning it from. I know they get a lot of social media, but I've heard it. And think about our country when those children have children and they pass that on to their children. When they don't think that the country they belong to is, is a great country. For over 100 years we've been told we evolved from apes and that there's no purpose and meaning to life. And it's no wonder people begin to act like animals when you tell them that. For over 25 years we've been indoctrinated to accept the gay lifestyle as normal and that if to think otherwise is to be a bigot or a racist. But interestingly enough, suicide is at an all-time high. There are hurting people out there. There is confusion out there. And we need to have truth with compassion. Turn to Luke 6.36. That's, that'll be our text today, a short text. It's a topical study. And so, but I'm, I'm reading it from the New Living Translation. 
when we left Wales, uh, I said, you know what? Anytime I teach in the future, I want to use the New Living Translation. I'm going to try and use some NKJV. That's what you use, right? Okay. But this, I, I'm going to tell you what the New King James says also. But the New, the New King James says you must be merciful just as your Father is merciful. The New Living Tra Translation says you must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. And I like the word compassionate. I think it helps you to encompass a little bit more, and that's what we're talking about today. So for, first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to look at some examples. We're going to realize that we're called to represent God. And we're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to give you some practical understanding of working with people with some problems. Everybody's got some kind of disposition to something, right? But sometimes we think that our, ours isn't so bad and others looks worse, right? So we're going to talk about that and help you to see that. And uh, then, so the, the, the goal today is that you might be equipped, encouraged, and open your eyes to those around you who are hurting. Sometimes those people hurt us. I mean, we, I mean, they don't hurt us. I mean, we're afraid that they're, we can't do anything to them. You know, sometimes just talking to them and engaging them. Ask them about their self. You know, you know how to make friends? You ask people, get them talking. Don't talk all, you don't do all the talking. Get them talking. Ask them questions. Be interested in them. You want to make friends? You have trouble making friends? Ask them about themselves. Their favorite topic, right? Mm -hmm. Get them talking, right? And that's how you make friends. If you want to win friends and influence people, <laughs> get them talking. And so that's, sometimes that's it. And you can say, hey, why do you look so downcast? Or why are you always over in the corner? Or, or maybe open your eyes to people that come and that are like that. And I'm gonna, I hope to get through this. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to machine gun you. So you're not going to keep up with the scriptures. So I'm just going to, and some of you going to paraphrase because I want to get to the practical on this. So first of all, let's look at our examples. You know, we're supposed to be compassionate as our Father is compassionate. And we all need examples because sometimes examples are better than precepts, right? We can follow an example. And we all need leaders and people to follow so we can see what it looks like practically. So the first example, of course, is Jesus. And now Jesus loved the unlovely, didn't he? He looked after the prostitutes. He went to the sick. He, he went to the lame. He went to the blind. He raised the dead. He removed demons. And when, they, when he hung on a cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's compassion on fire. That's mercy on fire. That's our, our example. You know, there was a lady who uh, knew that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. She knew where to go. She knew who it was that could help her. And we have that knowledge. And we need to so know God that he flows from us, overfills us, and flows from us. So he just naturally oozes from us so that we need the joy of the Lord to be our strength. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to pray. And that's where a lot of this, we don't, we don't start with a basic devotional life. And that's what we need for God to flow from us. We need an input to have an output. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and he can make the supreme difference in anybody's life if they'll look to him. He loves you and them more than anybody else has, can, or ever will. And so if we can get that, portray that, tell that, and invite people, we'll see God do a great work. You know, Bill Wilson at Metro Ministries in New York has a ministry to kids there in New York and has done a great work. He says, they won't care how much you know, they won't, they won't know how much you, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Sometimes people need care, compassion first. You're all right, what's wrong? And you can't get them talking, just sit with them. I had one pastor say, if you, sometimes we don't know what to say, just sit with them. Sometimes just be in there and they tell you to leave adamantly and sometimes when they tell you to leave you need to stay you sure come on tell me what's wrong Romans 8 says we're being conformed to the image of Christ so we're supposed to become like Jesus and Jesus was somebody that people knew they could go to the sinners felt comfortable with yet he portrayed truth but he had compassion and we're called to have passion as our father has compassion so being conformed to his image, we got some ways to go, right? We have maybe some predispositions. Maybe we're afraid of people with pierced noses or tattoos or people, you know, like one of my friends, I invited her, why don't you come down to, she says, I'm afraid of teenagers. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right. Well, uh, 
You know, so, you know, we have to step out. You know, Paul the Apostle, the boldest Christian that ever lived, he said he went and his knees were knocking when he went. I've never been that scared. Right? Oh, right. I mean, he'd been stoned, right, to, to, to death. They tried to, so I see why. He knew what was ahead of him. And God let him know what was ahead of him. If he let us know what was ahead of us, we might turn back. But he said he came with knees knocking and he said, pray that I'd be more bold. You see, the examples that we have that we need, like Jesus. We also have Chuck Smith, who has basically changed modern Christianity because he had compassion on hippies, drug addicts, and surfers. Back in the Jesus movement, the revival happened. He had compassion, and this compassion has led to a movement that is still going around the world. And Chuck Smith, one time, he came to church. All these hippies are coming, you know. Hippies slept in their vans. They slept outside. They didn't wear shoes. They were dirt. Bathing was not on their agenda, you know. And so they had come, and they had dirty feet and all this, and, and they would come in. And one day he came to church, and there was a sign on the outside of the church, and it said, no bare feet allowed. Sign the board. And so he came in and he ripped a sign down and called a board meeting. He said, do you, mean to, do you mean to say, because we have this beautiful new carpet, we've got to say to one kid that he can't come in because you've got bare feet? Let's rip up the carpet and have concrete floors, I also said. He says, if you have to say to them that you can't come in because you have dirty clothes, because we don't want to soil our new upholstered pews, let's get rid of them and get benches. But let's never turn a kid away from church, you know. We need to have the heart to reach people. And it's messy. You know, ministry can be messy. Wherever there's an ox, there's, the Bible in Proverbs says, wherever there's an ox, there's a, you know, there's a mess. But oxes produce something. Ministry can be messy. Um, so Chuck Smith had this compassion. So did his wife, his, his wife, Kay Smith, who actually originally said, oh, look at him running in the street. I think the first one was running on LSD, past their car or something, is when they first said, we got to do something. Because in the 60s, LSD and drugs and all that was really big. But because of his truth with compassion, his love for them, that he, they knew that he loved them. You see, sometimes they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. He went on to lead a movement that is, we're a part of today and honored to be a part of. And we need to remember and learn from history, learn from where we came so we know where we're going so we don't lose the next wave, the next group of whatever group comes in that is seekers. I'm going to tell you a group that's seekers in a little bit. So he's impacted the church worldwide, the church culture, mainly music and casual dress. Before, it was all hymns and shirts and, uh, shirts and ties. And there's not, I don't see too many shirts and ties today. So, uh, you know, so he impacted the style because he, the style of worship happened through Calvary Chapel and Maranatha Music. They started Maranatha Music because the hippies came in, saved, they loved Jesus, they wanted to sing their song, and he led them. And that started what we have now, praise music in churches. And that's went around the world. You know, Hillsong was affected by what Calvary Chapel did by Chuck Smith letting hippies sing their song to Jesus. By letting them bring in drums and sing their songs. So one thing very unique to Calvary Chapel, so you know those, is church planting. Uh, beside the compassion, the come as you are mentality and teach the word, uh, church planting is a big deal. One thing unique to the Jesus movement, a lot of people did similar things, but Calvary Chapel God did something about planting churches, and that's how this one's here today. God sent people out. People heard the word and couldn't contain it anymore, like, Jeremiah, i got to go out and share it. And that's what's going on still today that you're a part of. But not only that, Bible schools have started, uh, radio stations, missionaries, school of ministries, all these things because of one man who had truth with compassion. And we need to follow our examples. Chuck Smith has a, a, a quote I love. He says, better to err on the side of grace than to err on the side of judgment. You understand what he's saying? Instead of being, oh, I'm going to be judgmental on that person, or I'm going to judge them, prejudge them, I'm going to err on the side of being gracious to them, compassionate, as you see. Slide three. I'm going to read you a story. I put it in the wrong place, and I couldn't change it, so I've got to go back over here. So uh, this is a Teddy Stollard story. Mrs. Thompson was a school teacher who every year would say to her students, boys and girls, I love you all the same. I have no favorites. Of course, she wasn't being completely truthful. 
Teachers do have favorites, and what's worse, most teachers have students that they simply don't like. Teddy Stollard was a boy that Miss Thompson simply didn't like, and for good reason. He didn't seem interested in school. He wore a deadpan blank expression on his face, and his eyes were glassy and unfocused. When she spoke to Teddy, he merely shrugged his shoulders. His clothes were must, and his hair was unkept. He wasn't an attractive boy, and he certainly wasn't likable. When she marks Teddy's paper, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of putting X's next to the wrong answers. When she put the F's at the top of the papers, she did it with a flair. She should have known better. She had Teddy's records, and she knew more about him than she really wanted to admit. The records read, first grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Teddy is a grade three. Teddy is a good boy, too serious. He is a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. At Christmas, the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's class brought her presents, piled them on her desk, and crowded around to watch her open them. Among the presents was one from Teddy Stoddard. She was surprised that he had brought her a gift. Teddy's gift was wrapped in plain brown paper and held together loosely with scotch tape. On the paper were written simple words for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell a gaudy rhinestone, rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a cheap bottle of perfume that was half used. The other boys and girls began to giggle and smirk over Teddy's gifts. But Miss Thompson at least had enough sense to silence them by immediately putting on the bracelet and dotting out some of the perfume on her wrist, holding up her wrist to the other children and said, Smell, mm, doesn't that smell lovely? The other children, taking their cue from the teacher, readily agreed with oohs and ahs. When school was over and the other children left, Teddy lingered behind. He slowly came over to her desk and said softly, Mrs. Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks nice on you, too. I hope you like the presents I got you. Miss Teddy, when Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her. The next day, when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different person altogether. She was no longer just a teacher. She had become an agent of God, committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of the school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He caught up with uh, most of the students and even ahead of some. Once the school year ended, Miss Thompson didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. Then one day she re received a note that read, Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I will be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note came, Miss, Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I have had a good four years. Love, Teddy Stollard. And four years later, Dear, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting ne married next month the 27th to be exact, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Loved, Teddy Stollard. Miss Thompson went to the wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She deserved to be there. She had done something for Teddy that could never be forgotten. She had compassion on a struggling person and made all the difference in his life. You see, many people around us need someone to believe in and to build them up instead of tear them down. We need to have compassion as our Father has had compassion. So we've looked at some examples. Let's look at the second thing slide on slide three. Is we're called to represent God. And, you know, we need to realize that. He calls us all these wonderful titles that you have, and I hope you know and you need to own, because he gives you titles. And Howard Hendricks said, you can impress from a distance, but you can only make an impact up close. So we're going to look at some of the things God calls you to, but I want to first tell you, you know what one of the top questions that is Googled, spiritual questions, 
is, is there purpose and meaning to life? There's people out there searching. One of the top spiritual questions is, is there purpose and meaning to life? Do you know we have the answer to that Google question? Top spiritual question. There are people out there seeking. We've told them they came from monkeys and there's nothing at the end. There's no reason and purpose to life, but there is. And the first purpose is to know God. That's our main purpose. And I say that first because that's from which everything flows, your relationship with God. And when that wanes, everything else will wane. To know God is a relationship where we, we get what he wants us to do. We get our orders from headquarters. And so we saw in the garden that uh, before the fall that Adam would walk with God in the cool of the day. Relationship, the best, give him the best, the cool of the day. Walking with God and chatting with God. Give God your best. Best time of the day, give it to God. But we're also, the Bible says, created to bring God glory. Isaiah 43, 7. You're created to bring God glory. So you're given a call to represent him. And the representation is to bring him glory. John 15, 8 says we're, and he is glorified when we produce much fruit. And it goes on to say in the same place that we're created to bear fruit. That's purpose and meaning. Created to know God, to bring glory to God, and to bear fruit in his name. And when you do that, life has purpose and meaning. You know, I'm lucky to be alive. I've, I've overdosed and have been two, two severe wrecks. I've overdosed more times on cocaine than anybody I've ever heard of. And I should be dead from the first one. But God kept me alive. And I know I'm alive for a purpose. And I want to live with all the passion I have to live for him who died for me. I want to do all I can. And as I get older, I'm saying, God, you know what? The body ain't getting any better. So I, I want to I do more for you before, I, before my body is now the thing that's keeping me back. God, I want to do more. So 2020, we've expanded to two more facilities. And I'm just saying, Lord, give me the strength. And a lot of times, I don't have the strength. I, I literally lay down in bed and go, God, I'm so tired. I, 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 just, I need you to help me to get up to go do this. And I, and I pray. And I'm still tired, but I get up and do it anyway. You know, we have to overcome what we feel, our feelings, our, our, our body, and just say, it's gonna, my body's going to obey me. So we need to realize what we're called to, to bring glory, know God, to bring glory God to God and bear fruit in his name. And anything he calls to you to do in Acts 1.8, it says he empowers you to do. He empowers you to be his witness. The same Holy Spirit is in you that was in Paul the Apostle. So we need to go forward and say, God, you do it. Like today, I'm going, God, you do this, please, please. I got nothing. This is just words and wasting time unless you move the hearts of people. Unless he awakens your heart to hear and puts it into action to do something. So we're empowered by God, by the Holy Spirit. And so whenever we go somewhere, you feel weak, that's good. Because, you know, as I get older, the number one thing I quote is in my weakness, he is strong. Maybe you'll say, oh, I, I don't know what to say. What am I going to say to these people? Rhoda and I had to walk into to this new facility we're going into. We first have to go build a relationship with these kids. These are the most severely abused kids in the state. On their lunch hour at school, we were supposed to go in there, and we got like 40 minutes to build a relationship with them. I, didn't I went first because she hadn't been signed up yet. I didn't tell her how scared I was because she's going to have to do it the next week. <laughs> and I didn't tell her how intimidating it was for me, and I've been doing this for 30 years. And, uh, but how, you know, it's like, oh man, how am I going to do this? And you know, just go in there and boom, a girl uh, that just was released from the facility we were in two weeks ago, I see her and she was in my mentoring group. Boom. That helped us sit and talk with her a lot and different things. Then the next week we went, another girl walks in and runs and give me this hug. And I, she has been in my mentoring group for a long time and she has, she had been, um, uh, adopted to South Carolina, but she was back in Texas. And what are you doing? She said, didn't last a week. They want to try and take away my religion. She got saved in our facility. She went somewhere and said, no, you don't be a Christian. She's like, no, yes, I do. And that so moves my heart to know that she took a stand. She lost her f bio family. She lost many of her foster families. And somebody wanted to adopt her. And I'd never seen a kid so happy at that facility when she was being adopted because she was being accepted. She was going to be loved. But when she got there, they said, you're not going to go to church. No, no, we're atheists. She said, well, how are you going to work for me? Can you? I can't believe the stand she made. And I'm still so proud of her. And we're going to be mentoring these kids, giving them rides to church. And I just, oh, amazing. 
And I said, you know, I had just taken you off my prayer list because it got full and I was transferring pads. I said, just, I just took you off because I just checked you off because, you know, you're, you left, you were happy, you got adopted, everything's good. So I just took you off my prayer list. You know what she told me? She's incarcerated in this facility. She said, Clint, I am happy. I'm like, wow, wow, how do you do that? You might say, I don't know what to say. Well, God gives you another promise. He says, in the hour you know not what to say, the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. Amen. That's in Matthew 10, 19. So sometimes we don't know what to say. I don't, you know what? I don't, I, I pastor for 20 something years. I don't know what to say when people lose a loved one. I really don't. Really, what can you say to comfort someone? It's, but just be there. But in the hour you know not what to say, the Holy Spirit will give it to you. We're called to represent God, you see, and He's empowered us. He'll give us the words to say. In our weakness, He is strong. We're created to know God, to bring glory to God, and to bear fruit in His name. And He also calls us in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 12-ish. He calls you living stones. That's a little bit odd. Living stones. See, in the Old Testament, when God did something great, they'd pile up some stones so that when they'd walk by it, they'd tell their children, you know what God did right here? And they'd tell the story. But he says, you are living stones. You're to, to be a monument to God's glory and grace. You're to be saying what God's doing in your life. And, you know, when I was a young Christian, first new Christian, people would come up to me and, hey, what's, what's God doing in your life? I'm like, um, uh, you know, I couldn't answer. I just didn't know enough to understand. And I bet if I challenge you to go home and ask yourself and your family that question, what's God doing in your life? Because sometimes we can become stagnant or stale because we have lost that first love or because we have not put God first or because our relationship wanes and that for which you were created, the main thing is to know God. And that speaks of prayer and Bible and worship and worship with your life. Because you living stones being in, built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. He calls you a holy priesthood. We're to represent God to the people and the people to God. We're supposed to represent God to the people and, and telling them about God and showing them the way, but we're also supposed to represent the people to God by praying for them. You know, the kids I work with are severely damaged, severe trauma. And they get saved, but they still have complicating problems that will haunt them the rest of their life. Some, some overcome some don't, but whatever happens, they still have that memory of that awful thing that happened to them or multiple things that happened to them, and it affects their soul, their mind, their emotions, and their will. He calls you living stones, monuments to God's glory and grace. He calls you a holy priesthood, and he calls you ambassadors. Ambassadors are represented a country or a kingdom with no agenda of their own. He calls you an ambassador because you're supposed to have a representation of the kingdom of God. And when he taught us to pray, he said, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy will, you know, earth as is in heaven, right? So he says, that when you pray, pray about the kingdom. Have you stopped praying about the kingdom? It's the second thing you pray, he said. Your kingdom. Pray for the pastor when he speaks. Pray for the people that come here. You are very loving and very receptive, by the way. I got so many names and, and so awesome. Thumbs up, A plus, right? But we also have to love the unlovely, love the quiet, love the people that go over here and sit in the corner and don't say nothing. They're coming, trying to find love, trying to find acceptance, trying to find truth. And they're longing and they came here just that I might touch the hem of his garment. They knew where to come. We got to become that place. We got to become those people that they know where to go. I know there's a Christian down the street. I got saved because a girl came in and, and she said, I'm taking Bibles to San Francisco to the homeless. And a light went on. She's one of those, don't even know what you call it, go to church people? Christian? I didn't know if I knew the name Christian. And it sparked an interest in me. You're called to be living stones, a holy priesthood, an ambassador to represent God's kingdom. Slide four, practical approach. I'm giving this and a leaflet in the back because it's a compilation of years of ministry and I've came up with some things that people struggle with and things that keep them from hearing the message. Why do some people hear the same message and aren't affected? Why do you, some people hear a message and go out, 
I got to do something for Jesus. You know, I used to listen to Mike McIntosh all the time. When I would listen to Mike McIntosh, man, he just made me want to go do something for Jesus. And so, why do some people hear the same message and it doesn't affect them? There's so many reasons. Why do some people struggle and others do well? And so I've compiled this list. I put it in the back for you to take home and look at so that it can give you practical compassion for people. But first of all, there's different learning styles. Some people don't do well with hearing. My wife, if I were to give her my sermon, it would be a lot better than her hearing it because she reads really well. So, I mean, she would read, would read it and go, wow, I got so much out of it. Hearing it, less so. I'm a hearer learner. I got kids who I'm mentoring and, and one girl just goes, I'm not getting it. I'm an interactive learner. I go, oh man, that's the hardest kind to teach. So then I made all my mentoring. I went and changed my mentoring to a world where they had to fill in the blanks. So it's interactive. They have to do something. I also bring all these little fidget toys so they can fidget with toys. I also bring them things to eat to keep their hands busy. Because I'm trying to reach them with everything I got. And I'm constantly trying to find what's sweet will take them a long time to eat. We used to give them these little soups. You pour it and you eat. They love them. These little really bad for you soups with a lot of fat and really bad. My kids want to always use them. And no, you can have one a year. That's it. But they love them. And it brings back memories to them because that's all they were eating a lot of times. Because that's, parents didn't take care of them. Here, go eat some soup. Go eat some water. And, and that would keep them busy eating it. And keep their hands busy because they're all ADD, HD, and can't sit still. Sometimes they just stand up all of a sudden. I go, you ready to go or something? <laughs> you know, they just can't stand still anymore. And I do everything I can to reach them, to keep their hands busy, keep them interactive, keep it, do whatever I can. There's people who have different learning styles, different backgrounds and culture. Bad home lives. These kids have bad home lives. Some are lacking social skills. And they're going to come in the door here and they're not going to know how to shake hands or look you in the eye or say hi. Or they don't know how, literally. I had a girl, we just went to the facility that we're starting in. And uh, the girl here was saying, oh, this is my pastor. We'd been talking about a, a show they watched called uh, Lucifer. Some show, I've never heard of it. But they're telling me, oh, we watch this. I said, what do y'all watch? What do y'all do here? Oh, we like to watch the show Lucifer. And they're telling me, and she said, oh, this is my pastor. She goes, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm learning how to not say appropriate, inappropriate things. And I'm sorry if that was inappropriate. Because they're trying to teach her social skills. And she's like, oh, he's a pastor. And I'm talking, I like to watch a show called Lucifer. So she puts two and two together and says, they might not mix. But that's how she's struggling. But she's trying. I said, I don't care. I'm glad to know what you like, like and watch. I want to know what people like and watch. Great answer. <sighs> People are, have learning difficulties. Some people are on an autism spectrum. Some people have ADD and some people have ADDHD. And so they can't pay attention very long. I came home from my Thursday Bible study last week and they, they always say, how did it go? I do two Bible studies back to back. I'm entering in a Bible study and it's in the intense trauma ward at this facility. And uh, I, I said, I wish, they, I wish we could have recorded it and just put a camera back here. You know, can't take pictures of them and stuff and put them on the net anyway. But it was, I, I bet if somebody, if anybody see it, they say, well, you're not very effective. They interrupted you by 800 times. And 700 of them had nothing to do with, with what you were talking about. <laughs> One girl came the first time she came. She, I'll get ready to start my message. And she'd ask me a question. My mama says, and asked another question. My mama says, and I, and I say, okay, let's, let's, be, let's let that be the last question. I need to get on my Bible study. And I get another question. She said, I ain't been to a church in a long time. I got lots of questions, you know. So you got to let, you got to listen to them. I want to hear what's on their heart. Because when I hear what's on their heart, I can minister to their need and where they're at. Now, the Bible study is supposed to be 20 or 30 minutes. It was an hour that day. <laughs> because I still finished my Bible study, but with all the interruptions. And I bet anybody would have saw that, they would have said, why don't you just control your class? And normally, I would, with normal people, I would say, control yourself. Stop talking. Quit asking questions. But they're not, they don't have that ability. They're ITPT, a tense trauma, and they're living on a lower level because they've missed lots of school, and they've been severely abused, sex trafficked, not gone to school for years, and, and their, their mind isn't, they don't have any skills. we got to have compassion like our Father in Heaven has compassion. Here's a list of things that people struggle with that we need to have compassion for that also is like keep people from hearing the message and making lasting changes in their life. And God can do anything if you'll come to Him. And if we teach people, keep going to God. Keep asking of God. And sometimes we just got to accept people as they are. Meet them where they're at. Trust God to do the work. 
I've listened to different people. They have a, I've got a few opinions that I've put in my list. And Ray Comfort says the reason people struggle is because they have not believed a proper gospel. Because he teaches evangelism training, so that's his reasoning. A lot of Calvinists I've heard have said it's because they're not saved. But uh, 1 Corinthians is all about people who are carnal and worldly and struggling. So they're, he calls them Christians. So I don't see how they reconcile that. Kenneth Wiest in his uh, New Testament Greek on Galatians says that people that do not know about the work of the Holy Spirit therefore cannot depend on the Holy Spirit and thus cannot express and glorify Jesus properly due to their ignorance. He claims most Christians are like this. And so some people would say well, they need a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's another popular idea that people have come up with. I've came up with a few. In my time, I started my little list. Then I found a really cool list that was better than mine. But I'm going to give you some of mine. I believe some people struggle and don't listen and don't do as well because of unbelief. Not because they don't believe, but because of uh, a, a, not, not, it's not an absence of faith, but a lack of faith. Unbelief. A lack of discipleship and good teaching and examples. A lack of a devotional life. Because it, it's your time with Jesus from where everything comes. That's where you get his vision. That's where you get his heart. That's where you get his peace. That's where you remain in your joy. That you can go out into this miserable world and flow like torrents of living water. And so a lack of a devotional life will certainly squelch out the life of God. People have learning difficulties, of course, and a big one in America is too busy for God. Thus drown out the possibilities due to a lack of close relationship and availability because you're just too busy. Last, one, last time when I was here, I taught about when God blesses you, don't forget him, what he told Israel. That's the same word for America today. When God blesses you, don't forget him. We have so many blessings, so many things. We've got so many channels, so many things we've got to take our kids to and so many opportunities that we forget God in the midst because we're so busy with what he's blessed us with. There's a saying that says, the devil can't destroy you, he'll discourage you. And if he can't do either of those, he'll distract you. So we need to seek first the kingdom and all else will be added unto you. I also think a lack of surrender is a problem why people struggle. They haven't surrendered and said, my life is not my own. It's yours, God. Oh, well, I sort of want to still hold on to this bed and do what you want. No, no, no. Do, you can sort of do what you want, but ask me first, God. A lack of surrender. See, total victory requires total commitment. I also think that and have seen sin and idols in our life have uh, hinder our walks too. We once, in our church in Wales, 80% of our church was under the age of 30 and mostly new believers. So we had a lot of immaturity and young people th issues and, and because they were single, then we had some sexual things happen and then they happened again with the same people and, 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 and anyway, it went on and on and, and, I'd ha and they'd come tell me, I'd find out somehow, they'd come tell me and, you know, and, and I would rather err on the side of grace and judgment and I'd work with them, keep them accountable. And one of these, these two got married and, and they told me, thanks, Pastor Clint, for your grace for us. They stayed in. I could have kicked them out. I could have made them feel horrible and run away. But no, I'm going to tell you how I, why I, I'm able to do those things in a minute. Sometimes people are unsaved also. And you gotta, if you're ministering to anybody, first you've got to find out, are they a Christian? And some people just are Christians, but they don't look like Christians, right? And so you've got to figure out, are they Christians? And there's a whole way to do that. Maybe I'll do that next time. We worked with a girl, and she was in her 20s. She had been abused sexually as a child. Then she was abused sexually by her youth leader. And now she was in her 20s, and she was being sexually abused by a man. And she would call us and say, come, come rescue me. I, I, you know, he left the apartment, and, and, and he won't let me leave. And, and so we'd go get her and bring her in. And she was addicted to three drugs, prescription drugs, when we found her. And we got her off those drugs. We detoxed her off of three drugs that were prescribed to her. And uh, you wouldn't, I don't think any of you would have probably thought, this girl ain't a Christian. I mean, she's having this sex with this guy, and... And keeps going, and she kept going back to him. We'd bring her back and say, make her safe, and then she'd go back to her apartment. And then he would get back in her life, and she, some saved me. We'd go save her again, until I finally said, "Enough! I can't, I can't do this anymore. You've got to." But she's still walking with Jesus. She went, found another church, and but um, you know, some people don't look like they're Christians. But you certainly, if you're going to minister to somebody, you need to know whether they're Christians or not. 
Some people are carnal or worldly, and they, therefore they don't experience God's best that he has for them. Thus, what comes from their life is not his best because of the works of a divided heart. Worldly or carnal people. Now, from a book called Preaching with Purpose, Jay Adams, a Christian counselor and teaches, a professor at university that teaches counseling, here's his list. I thought his list was awesome. I had my little list going for years, and then I was teaching, I think, Ephesians 4, and this was in his commentary on Ephesians 4. And this is why some people don't hear the message, don't grow, and struggle. First one is excuse making. Excuse making is a way of avoiding responsibility, deflecting blame, and justifying sin. Excuse making sears the conscience by desensitizing God's early warning system. Vance Havner said, excuse making is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. The second thing he came up with is a lack of discipline, lacking order, method, regularity, planning and scheduling, ability, perseverance, and or commitment, all vital ingredients in discipline. They truly wish to respond rightly, nevertheless fail in doing so because of the sloppy, sinful, undisciplined patterns and habits in their life. We need to be compassionate as our Father is compassionate. Not everybody's disciplined like maybe you. The third one was presence of complicating problems. All the kids I work with have this one. And probably will have them all their life. Some will overcome and move on and do well. And I'm always teaching them how to move on and overcome. Giving them the tools. Presence of complicating problems interfere with one's desire or ability to respond to a given sermon as he ought, thus forming a barrier. They need to be, discover, identify, and solve complicating problems, and sometimes they need to seek help to do so. Because sometimes you just can't see it, or your life is so messed up, or you don't even know how to sit and meditate. Did you know a lot of people, young people, don't know how to think? I was amazed by this. I've been working with young people for 30 years, and I sat with a man, a young man in his 20s, and I was saying, okay, and I was counseling him, and I said, you need to go away and think about it. He said, what do you mean? I said, you need to go away and think about it. He says, what do you mean? I said, you need to go away in the back room there and think about it. He says, what do you mean? <laughs> I go, and I go, whoa. I got something new here I've never experienced. I said, you know, you go back in this room over here with a pen and paper. You sit quietly before God, and you think about your life. Because he is at a crossroads and looking for what he should do next. People don't know how to think today. Media, I guess, I don't know. I, I called a psychologist. I know the head of, he has a psychology degree and all kind of degrees, more degrees than anybody I know. I called him and said, have you seen this? He said, oh yeah, I wrote a paper on it. It's online and all this stuff. I, oh, he says it's due to the changing the pathways in the brain through media. People can't think. We're used to constant stimulation. And that's why we see a lot of ADD people think because there's too much stimulation at a young age. In regular things, somebody talking to you for 45 minutes, not stimulating enough unless they're doing cartoon actions, you know, or something like that, or, or really interesting to watch and somehow can really keep their attention. So presence of complicating problems is another one. Failure to repent. Repentance is a change of uh, your mind toward one's sin and toward God or toward others that leads to an outward change. It has to begin in the mind and then it, it ends up in an outward change. This is always a precondition to biblical change and, and has to do with overcoming sin. You've got to change your mind about your sin. You've got to see it as hurting you. You've got to see it. I mean, that's how I realized I want to change my life. I realized, man, I hate drugs. This destroyed my life. I mean, I, and when I was in jail for a month, the first time I read the Bible, I was already wanting to change my life. And I go, man, I hate jail. I, I want to change my life. When I got out of here, didn't have, didn't have money even for a bus. I had to walk home. That was a long way. And during that time, I said, you know, I've got to change my life. And that's when I flew to California to get a job and try and change my life and where I found Jesus. When I asked him to take away the desire for the drugs, and he did. And the next day, it was gone. And I had no capacity to follow and serve him all the days of my life. And I still don't, but I am. But he said, okay, I'll take you. Because he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Some, some change in counseling is also just a simple matter of growth, too. His fifth thing he lists was other hindrances, like self-pity or being irresponsible, who lives are dominated by ingrained habits which hinder what you want to accomplish, who will be fearful about obeying, who are under a load of guilt, or who love the world too much. The girls we work with are full of guilt. Think about their lives as I hear about them. They're sexually abused. They finally say something after years of abuse. 
By saying something, they lose their family. They get put in a facility. They're traumatized already so bad that they go to mental hospitals. And then they get put in a foster family. And because of their trauma, the foster family rejects them. Then they get another foster family rejected. And they're filled with guilt. Because if I just wouldn't have said anything. Or if I would have said something immediately. And they blame themselves. Full of guilt, hindering, hindering their growth. See, we must bring context into the compa bring compassion into the context of our hearts. Be compassionate as our Father is compassionate. I believe all of us need to think through our theology on, or and our, our thinking and understanding on people that are claiming to be trans or gay. Because we've, the church has treated it like it's the unforgivable sin. And here's how I work with that. I want to tell you my secret. Uh, I've got to finish up pretty quick here. Let me tell you, my favorite, I've been preaching the gospel for 30 years to a lot of troubled people. And my favorite memory from November 2018 when I was mentoring five girls. And the first thing I do is have them go around, tell me about yourself. And they all went around the room, some saying I'm gay and some say I, I do drugs. All of them said they cut themselves to try and find relief or to punish themselves. And they all went around the room and I came to a girl and I said, tell me about yourself. She said, I'm a lesbian, transgender, atheist, and a Satanist because of what my dad did to me. I said, okay. And as they shared all, went around the room, I, at the end of it I said, you know what? All of you girls are looking for hope in the wrong place. And I told them about Jesus, and all five received the Lord. And the girl who was a lesbian, transgender, atheist, when she rose her head from praying, she said, I am a girl because God made Adam and Eve. I love that. I love that memory. And so we need to think through this. this there's, I believe there's a, a hunger out there for homosexual, transgender people who are hurting. Many of them are that way because they were abused as a child or something to do with their family life. Not all. Some feel they're born that way. But we still need to have a heart for those who feel different, isolated, because they'll be received into the homosexual community with great fanfare. We need to receive them with lots of love compassion and understanding telling them the truth but realizing that they're struggling with something C.S. Lewis said we tend to think the worst sins are the ones we aren't tempted to commit their sin looks a lot worse than my sin in other words right what my sin oh it's not that bad but look at them and because we don't most of us aren't tempted to homosexual or transsexual sin we don't understand it so it looks like the worst sin in all and the church hasn't treated people right. We need to love people. Jesus would have loved the homosexual, the transgender, and he would have went to them. And they would have known that he was somebody that they could go to. And they need to know that the church is a place that they can come to. They're very confused. They need help. And you, we have the answer. Here's my secrets that I do. I keep my sin ever before me. I keep my sin ever before me. Yet in the shadow of the cross. That's from Psalm 51. where David said. You know, that means basically, here's how you do that practically. You take their sin that you think is so bad. Oh, they committed adultery. Oh, they're watching porn. Oh, they're gay or they're lesbian or they're trans. And then put your sin there. I hope you know what your sin is. It needs to be ever before you. Because you need to be ever praying about it. And put your sin there in that blank. And then treat them the way you would like to be treated with your sin. That's my secret to doing it. You know, I took, um, it takes great humility and compassion to love people like that. But, you know, the worst confession I ever took as a pastor, a woman came to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble. Uh, she started coming to our church because the other church couldn't let her stay there anymore. And she said, I had sex with her son and her daughter. And she was going to go to jail for it. And she went to prison. And I listened to her. I, I, I counseled her for six weeks. I didn't judge her. M when I was finished, my sin was ever before me. I didn't go, man, she's wicked. She had been abused herself as a child. And when it was all done, six weeks of counseling is all she needed. I came to think, thinking, well, I don't know what else to tell you. I went through everything, anything else you need to talk about. You no. Know? She went on to be one of the keenest people in our church and still is walking with Jesus today. I think about her children and how awful it is for them, but I never thought how awful is she because my sin is ever before me. I'm looking at my sin. I've got to deal with my sin. I help her with hers. I deal with my sin. My sin is ever before me. 
one of her son, her son is on heroin and she don't get to have, see her family or grandkids and she's paid a price. She went to jail, she paid her price and she's walking with Jesus still. Some people's lives are so messed up, you can't even tell they're a Christian. The other thing I do in closing is I believe in the power of love, loving people. Loving people. Quit looking at their outside and love people. I also believe in the power of the gospel, the power of the word, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of prayer. These people we work with got a lot of complicating problems. So I pray for them. I started, you know what, a lot of people, one third of them are getting saved, so I started writing their name down. I got to pray for those who get saved. Because as soon as they get saved, they say a lot of bad things happen as soon as they get saved. And so I said, I got to start praying for these kids because sometimes I don't get to hear that they're struggling. They just got saved and bad things are happening. I, that's what I do. I pray. I believe in those as the power to change them. And I try and move, God, move them by prayer alone. Tony Evans says, personal development is not an event. Neither is it a one-size-fits-all experience. Development takes time, tests, failure, and overcoming. God knows each one of us individually. He knows what we each needed in order to develop and strengthen our spiritual muscles and sharpen our spiritual insight and wisdom. More often than not, this requires detours in life to allow us the opportunity to learn, grow, and develop. Basically, Jesus said, summed it up, love God and love others. Love God. If you want, got a question, you know, what would love do? That's what the question I asked my, most with all our under 30 group, what would love do? When they came with all their problems of intersexual things and problems and telling, I'd say, Lord, what would love do? And that's the way I responded. You can impress at a distance, but you can only make an impact up close. So we need to have compassion as our Father has compassion. We need to remember our examples of Jesus and Chuck Smith and loving the hippies. And we need to remember what God's called us to. And we need to realize there's a lot of reasons why people struggle. A lot of people need help. A lot of people aren't like you. And so we need to have compassion for them. The list is in the back. If you want to get it and look over it and try and help build your compassion for people. And if you uh, want to sign up for our newsletters or prayer list or anything, there's a list back there also next to it. And today, if you don't know Jesus or you need prayer for any reason, during the last song, you can come up and you can get some prayer. If you don't know Jesus, Jesus loves you. And he wants to make the supreme difference in your life. And he loves you more than anybody else has, can, or ever will. But you've got to come to him. You've got to come his way. And his way is by the cross. He died for your sins so that you didn't have to. He went to the grave, but he rose again. And whoever believed, whoever received to them would become children of God. And you have to change your mind about your sin and agree with God that it's bad. And then you've got to say, God, I want you. And that's how you receive Jesus. And you'll receive whoever will come to him, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. So as I close in prayer and the worship team comes up, come up, there'll be some people up here to pray for you. If you want to receive Jesus, they'll pray for you. Don't leave here without him. Father God, thank you so much for today. I pray today you'd move our hearts to compassion for the lost and for those struggling, for those isolated, those with insecurities and fears and complicating problems, that we would be loved, patient, and persistent, that we would be compassionate as our Father is in compassion. In Jesus' name, amen.